I had a brief moment of terror thinking that I had stopped recording. <laughs> Sound familiar? Hey guys, it's your friendly neighborhood Rummy in here with a cold, as you might be able to hear in my voice, but powering through it. And today, Michael, Erica, and I will be discussing video game sequels. We'll talk about different types of sequels and what makes a good sequel. We broke video game sequels into three types. Direct sequels, or plot sequels. Character sequels, or anthology series, or theme, or aesthetic sequels. If you asked most people to define a sequel, they'd probably describe a direct sequel, where the same setting characters and sometimes even main problem is shared between the first and second games. Final Fantasy X-2, for instance, is a direct sequel to Final Fantasy X. All of the game's events occur just a year after the original game, and a large part of gameplay is simply visiting past characters and learning what's happened to them. Some games really amp up the connection between games by even having shared save data between games. For instance, you can upload your finished game save data from Ark the Lad 1 into Ark the Lad 2. When the characters from Ark the Lad 1 show up part way through the second game, uh, they'll have the same high levels that you left them at in the first game, which really makes you feel like you've accomplished something. Uh, the same thing happens in Suikoden 1 through 3. The Xenosaga games offer special secret items in the later games if you upload the finished save data of the previous game. Uh, Ramin, weren't you saying Golden Sun has shared save data too? Yes, Golden Sun has shared save data between 1 and 2, and it's also an interesting example of how a direct sequel um, in a video game can do different things than a movie can in terms of um, switching perspectives. Because not only do you share your save from Golden Sun 1, but in the second game, you are playing as the enemies you were fighting and discovering via playing them that they were, spoiler alert, right all along. Um, and the game saves over your stats and also saves over their stats and ports it over to the, the second game. Um, lots of movies try to switch perspective like that between villain and hero, but I think in a video game when you're uh, taking on the perspective directly, it can be a little bit more impactful if played well, like I, I think Golden Sun does. Some game series all do take place in the same universe, but the continuity between the games is so convoluted that it almost doesn't seem worth it. We're looking at you, Drake and Guarded Mirror. Kingdom Hearts and Zelda. And while I'm an avid Kingdom Hearts fan, we have to admit that the storyline does jump around a lot with all of these sequels. One large casualty of gaming becoming more mainstream since the 90s is that some game companies have jumped on the commercial bandwagon and produced sequels simply because they found a cash cow in the first iteration. Stories with more complexity in games need more forethought and care, especially with a game like Kingdom Hearts having combined Final Fantasy and Disney characters already had increased odds of success right out of the gate. Zelda has a crazy timeline that's kind of an indicator of the creators trying to make sense of a series connection between the games after they'd already created each game. Um, for instance, the connection between Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask um, is kind of flimsy. It's The game's not totally clear about, is he in an alternate world? Is he um, alternate timeline from Ocarina? Um, but that's the tip of the iceberg in comparison to like some of the stuff that gets further down in the timeline, like Skyward Sword in one direction and um, Twilight Princess in another. Um, but that's one reason why I prefer to think of the Zelda series as an anthology series. Um, where we're just experiencing different incarnations of the same core cast of characters. Or I guess you could even say that that makes it a character series, but it, there are a few more plot connections there than, say, in Mario. There are a bunch of games that fit the direct sequel mold. Too many to mention out loud, really. Instead, I'm just going to have a list of some of our favorites scroll by on the screen. Mm, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. In a way, Chrono Cross gets away with being a direct sequel in spite of some tenuous connections to the original because both games are all about crazy timelines to begin with, so are 
metric by which we're judging how much these connections make sense is already different. The connection between chrono trigger and chrono cross is often a point of contention. Some people think the connection between the games is too complicated. The connection isn't really complicated at all, though. We basically get to learn what happens to my favorite chrono trigger character after that game is done. The plot of chrono, chrono cross on its own, though, is another incredibly messed up story. Other Square and Square Enix games that fail as direct sequels are the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy of games, which are connected loosely at best and require universe-altering plot turns in order to make any sense. However, as the only person who has played them and who has entirely too um, much interest in their soundtracks, I felt like a useful blooper cut for us would be me dancing to the Final Fantasy XIII 2 soundtrack. Which I didn't pull up beforehand. So you're just gonna, we're gonna sit here together while I do that. I'm an empath. Mother 3, the sequel to Earthbound, is a direct sequel that does a lot right, because it keeps just enough core cast to keep the connection strong, while also introducing enough new characters that things feel fresh. Um, the way it leads the player on with clues about cast char past characters, while delaying the big revelatory moments as long as possible for meeting those characters, is um, really keeps it engaging. The Square games that take place in Ivalice are not all Final Fantasy games. Final Fantasy Tactics and Final Fantasy XII take place in the same world, but centuries apart from each other, so there's absolutely no in-game connection between them. Vagrant Story takes place in Ivalice too, but uh, I'm not sure if it's connected to either game. I'm playing it right now, and I'm not very far in. Sometimes I think the better question is whether or not a sequel even should be made. Some games already have satisfying enough endings on their own that there aren't enough unanswered questions to justify having a sequel. The Final Fantasy XIII series is a good example of this. Uh, the shitty sequel to Final Fantasy XII that was released for like Game Boy Advance or the DS or one of those two. Um, after beating Final Fantasy XII, was anyone really asking, hey, I wonder what happens to Vaughn, because he's the main protagonist of the sequels, and I think what most of us can agree upon about that game is that he's one of the least interesting characters. Sorry! I'm going to agree with Ramin, sometimes a sequel just isn't needed. Hello, Mega Man, we do not need 12 of you. Hat tip to Mega Raptor, this isn't Land Before Time. I will also add that a good legacy sequel is great, but if you're going to introduce an entirely new cast of characters in the same setting as a previous cast, some distinction has to be established. 50 years in the future, different planet around the same sun, and then find some way to bridge that gap in the plot. This was always my problem with Final Fantasy when I was a young dumb kid it was hard to see why they were a series when they were all so different not to just dump hate on final fantasy direct sequels but another no-no for me in making a sequel is when a character has seemingly no connection to their personality from one game to the next this is exemplified in final fantasy X 2 i can't imagine how any person even a person who goes through such a traumatic experience as yuna could possibly have that much of a personality change in just one year. I think there should be a good balance between connections to the previous game and new ideas, both mechanically and in the plot. I agree. My favorites of the games we've talked about so far are Sweet Coden 1 through 3. A few things make these games feel like they fit together so well. Each game mostly takes place in only one country. 
and deals with that country's politics, problems, and maybe a conflict with one other country. The conflicts in one game sometimes even sort of help cause the problems in a neighboring country in a later game. The few characters who exist in two or three of these games also help to make everything feel more cohesive. There's the blind seer who guides the heroes on their quest, the few wandering warriors who just can't stand injustice and go to help the good guys wherever help is needed. I agree with both of you. And as we've talked about, we want to aim for some kind of steady continuity for uh, character development or plot development or just continuing a timeline within this world when you're doing a good direct sequel. But once that continuity is decided on, um, it should be consistent with everything that we've built up to this point. And then it should have the sequel, like with any good movie sequel, has to have something to say in its own right. It has to be a good quality game in its own right. Not necessarily that, I mean, it's nice when you can pick up a sequel game and be able to enjoy it for what it is on its own. That's not necessarily always possible. But it should be able to stand alone in one way or another, especially in terms of quality. Character sequels are games that don't have the same specific story between any two games connected, but instead have the same main character or a group of characters uh, transplanted into a new scenario every time. These games can be more plot-heavy games or not. For example, on the plot-heavy side, we have Breath of Fire games. Ryu and Nina are characters in every game, and Ryu can transform into a dragon, and Nina has wings and is a magic user. And um, Undertale and Deltarune. The two stories seem like they could be directly related, but the creator said that's not true. It's more that, the, that many of the same characters have been transplanted into a new scenario and a new plot. Less plot-heavy games include platformers like Crash Bandicoot, Donkey Kong, Mario, Mega Man, and Sonic. In each of these cases, the characters and a few basic facts about their relationships remain the same. Mario always reappears with his brother Luigi and his love, Peach, for instance, but their setting, problems, or circumstances may change. And one of my personal favorites in this space is actually the middle ground, the Good Fighter games. In my opinion, you can't really get better than Mortal Kombat in this area because you have such a depth of characters with such good background stories. And having that depth and that understanding of those characters makes does make the gameplay more satisfying for some. But for those of us who may just be picking it up as a social activity with friends or family or are just looking to like sort of improve their fighter skills on various platforms, that's okay too. And it's, it's good to be able to pick those things up without getting in depth with these characters. They're there whether you pick it up or not. But also a lot of fighting games are technically direct sequels too, but in a way that totally doesn't matter. It's probably better not to bother with the continuity between games when the point of the game is to do the punches and the kicks good. I think the plot of character sequels usually works best when it's simple because the more complex you make these new plots, the less likely it seems that these same exact characters would reappear in these new circumstances. Um, I also think that character sequels need to introduce really interesting or really different mechanics, at least sometimes, to compensate for the characters staying so similar. I think one exception to this might be Super Mario RPG. The plot isn't really that complicated, and the relationships between characters are, for the most part, what we expect. But there are some really unusual things going on. First off, it is an RPG, so the mechanics are very, very different from the rest of the mainline Mario games. Princess Toadstool, she wasn't called Peach until Mario 64, and Bowser have some pretty significantly different shades to their personalities. Bowser helps Mario rescue the princess from someone else, and then she becomes a very capable member of the party. Square and Nintendo took some real risks with this game, and it paid off. I'm actually going to contrast with you on this one a little bit, because I think that a good character sequel can have potential <clears throat> for a more complex plot for its characters. Um, 
I, I think back to like the old Tomb Raider games, the original ones that came out, like Tomb Raider 2, she went to the Great Wall of China and an opera house in Vienna. She was in Sydney and she was all over the place. And trust me, it worked. And Tomb Raider's plots don't really depend on each other all that much from game to game. It was more about seeing the exciting things that the character could do and how far they could push it. And of course, that was also a time when graphics were improving by leaps and bounds at every turn. Um, speaking of Tomb Raider, a uh, good sequel, good character sequel really doesn't need any of this aesthetically pleasing stuff to go on. Uh, we do not need an increase in cup size for Lara Croft. We do not need Max and Snake to keep getting younger and younger with every game that comes out. Uh, so let's keep that in mind with character sequels. Let's let's keep it close to reality. I really appreciate when old tropes are played with in character sequels. Uh, isn't that why people like, for instance, Luigi's Mansion? Uh, it's fun to see some things change and some things stay the same, you know? Like, uh, yes, Luigi gets his own game, but even there he's scared and it's seemingly inept, you know? Uh, so you keep some and you change some. Some gameplay elements also need to carry over from game to game, stay within the same universe. Ironically, a good character sequel usually does carry over these sort of basic gameplay elements as well. Like wherever you are in the Mario catalog, uh, the wonderful pingy sound when you pick up a coin or the satisfying gravitational plop on top of the head of a, any of your enemies is just ubiquitous throughout the whole thing. Uh, same thing with Mega Man. There's a lot of similar functions throughout those games. And, you know, even though Sonic the Hedgehog's gameplay elements have been pretty inconsistent from round to round, there's still a lot of similarities in his movements and the way you control them. And, you know, frankly, half the reason I replay Sonic the Hedgehog is to see him get impatient with me when I let him go idle. Games and anthology series don't have a direct plot carrying over from game to game or specific characters appearing in different games. Instead, they carry a certain theme, a certain aesthetic, or certain tropes. The anthology series we're probably most familiar with is the Final Fantasy games. All tend to have themes or ideas like chosen heroes, crystals, chocobos, moogles, the four fiends, and a father figure character named Sid. For the most part, except for direct sequels within the series, games like Dissidia and the character Gilgamesh, who is supposed to be the same character in each game in which he appears, these games have no plot connection to each other or shared characters among them. In a way, Persona's format makes it easy to explain a character sequel, although there's technically evidence that Persona 4 is at least a direct, partial direct sequel to Persona 3, but anyway. Each character in a Persona game is represented by a different tarot card, and while that mechanic and a few other core characters, like Igor, do reappear consistently throughout the games, otherwise each game has a completely new cast of people to fill those tarot roles differently. Uh, mechanically, the Persona games are, are more like Final Fantasy because only some themes stay there, but most of it isn't literally the same. And all of the games take place somewhere in the real world, but the plot setting and the characters are changing. I think for an anthology series, um, you might need about as much variety in the mechanics as in a character sequel, because the first thing most people probably would want to cr critique in an anthology series is that everything uh, stays the same and that it's not changing enough. I mean, if you look at how people critique anthology series in television, it's much the same. People are quick to point out for shows like uh, American Horror Story, for instance, where the same core cast of actors is playing new characters each time, people love to be like, oh, that season they were playing the same person. Da, 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 da. Uh, because I think one of the implicit claims of an anthology series is, look at what we changed. It's kind of, you know, the um, that's one of the questions that the viewer often wants to answer. Yeah, I think it can be a tough balancing act. Resident Arc put out a recent video comparing Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy, 
some Dragon Quest fans have complained that the series hasn't changed enough, and some Final Fantasy fans have complained that this series has changed too much. Check out that Resonant Arc video. It's great. Um, I've already shared it on the Remichael Facebook page, but I'll link it in the comments here, too. I have nothing to add. I really like recurring elements done in new ways in anthology series. One of my favorite parts of Final Fantasy is seeing the six degrees of Sid separation from each game, which is what I like to call it, six degrees of Sid separation. I don't know. I think I'm funny. I'm probably not. In Final Fantasy VIII, for instance, Sid is the head of a military academy, but then in X, he's the head of um, a desert nation and a pilot, but then in thirteen, he's a pilot, but he's a puppet for the nation and not the head of it. Yeah, I agree, Ramin. I also really like uh, the little Easter egg elements that you can get in anthology series sometimes, and I would, I would actually like to see more games that are aiming for the sort of epic draw of Final Fantasy with multiple games in a similar universe. And when that does happen, I like it when the small details amount up to, you know, a certain style of building or a certain military costume or some sort of, some small element that can sort of easily be overlooked. But those details are actually uh, very meaningful to me in these anthology series, and it does lend itself to the continuity of games. One game series that we haven't mentioned? Pokemon. These games in some ways fit the direct sequels mold, the character sequels mold, and the anthology series mold all at the same time. In many ways, the direct sequel touches are the least impactful. Though each game takes place in the same physical world, and even with the connection like the current Pokemon champion being named Blue in the second generation games as a nod to one of the default character names in the first generation, it it doesn't really feel like they have any stakes in connection with each other. The anthology series makes sense because they all are basically doing the same thing. You capture animals and make them fight each other. Mostly, Pokemon games make more sense to me as a character sequel, especially given that so many of the Pokemon reappear, whether they actually physically reappear or there's a, an essential clone of them in a later game. So I think if you're creating a sequel game, whether in real life or just in your head, you have a lot of questions you could ask yourself. How much do you want to experiment with the format? Do you just want to stick to the basics? Do you want to try just a character sequel or just a direct sequel? Or do you want to try to mix multiple types? Or perhaps the questions you should be asking yourself first. Why do you want this to be a sequel as opposed to an entirely new unrelated game? Are you only trying to make money off the hype of the original? Or is there more to say with these characters, those tropes, or that style of gameplay? I think there really are no wrong answers here. Even doing something only for money isn't inherently bad. And different people like different types of games. But we all want our games to be great, right? Thanks so much for watching, guys. We hope you liked our video about sequels. Please comment, like, share, dance for me, monkey. You know, whatever your hearts desire. By the way, you look so nice today. That eyeshadow does wonders for you. I can't anymore. <laughs> God, these games are weird.